Have you ever felt a knot in your stomach just because somebody didn't reply to your message immediately? Or have you spent your whole shower practicing how you're going to respond to somebody if they get mad at you? Or have you tossed and turned in your bed all night long, afraid that somebody might be mad at you, only for them the next day to be perfectly fine? And now you're exhausted because you spent all night worrying. Now, these common experiences are often misattributed to more of a general anxiety issue, but that's not necessarily the case. These could actually be signs of a much deeper pattern. It's something called anxious attachment style, and it can hold you back from building relationships that fulfill your true desires. So today I'm going to show you the seven signs that you need to look out for and how to make sure that anxious attachment style never holds you back again. I am Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist. I focus on helping people build better relationships and how to fix their attachment issues if they're there. Shout out to all of my members who support this channel. Thank you so much for your help. It means the world to me, and I could not do this without you. And all the new members who are coming in today, welcome. And this is a great video for you to come in on because it will walk you through exactly what attachment looks like. So let's get into this and cut right to the heart of anxious attachment style to help you figure out if this might be affecting you. And if so, how you're going to repair it so that you can stop worrying all the time and you can become confident in your romantic connections instead. So take a deep breath and let's get started. Now, most people are really un tragically unaware of their own attachment style. This is the way that you build relationships with other people to give and receive love based especially on your childhood relationships, with your caregivers especially, and how those issues now affect your romantic and your professional relationships in your adult life. So attachment issues in your life, they can hold you back because you might be afraid nobody else is going to take you seriously, nobody else is going to listen to you, nobody else is going to be fair with you, and you may even believe that you don't deserve for people to listen to you or take you seriously or be fair with you. You actually might believe there's something wrong with you on the inside that stops you from opening up to other people and receiving that love and receiving that connection. Now, this can lead to a spiral of low confidence that prevents you from going out and taking risks of doing necessary things in your life that, that are hard and are challenging, but they're more challenging for you than for the average person because you live with this chronic insecurity. Now, when you fix this, when you have more secure attachment, when your children, when your childhood relationships show you that people will care for you, will take you seriously and will be fair and that you deserve it, you're more comfortable to take more risks, right? There's something called Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's a pyramid and there's five layers to this. At the bottom is food and shelter for the day. Second level though is safety and security. This is where most people fail right here at this point if they have attachment issues because you never feel safe and secure. That means you can't move up Abraham Maslow's pyramid into love and belonging, the positive aspects of it, into level four, self-esteem and career and growth, and level five, self-actualization. Those are above where you can reach because you're at safety and security. You're stuck here. There's a way to fix this, so don't be worried. But this, this pyramid is exactly why life gets so much better when you fix anxious attachment and you become secure. Because as you realize, I don't have to toss and turn in my bed all night. I can just have a conversation. I can just ask that person, hey, are you upset? If so, how can we fix it? You don't have to spend your whole shower worrying what you're going to think and say if somebody might get mad at you. Because if they do, you can say, oh, wow, I'm really sorry. How can we fix this? What can we do? And you'll believe that it's possible because you'll be around people who will do that. That's the other piece is when you have attachment issues, you tend to spend time with people who don't treat you well. You'll gravitate toward those people because they seem honest because they treat you like you believe you deserve to be treated. When you fix that attachment, you will spend more time around people who do treat you positively and who will work with you. Life gets so much better. Imagine if you are in a romantic connection and you get kind of worried about something and you're not sure if you can ask the other person or talk about it. So you just say, it's going to bite the bullet and do it. And you say, hey, I'm having this feeling over here. Are you upset with me or is everything okay? And they say, 
oh yeah, you're having that feeling? No, that's totally okay. No, I'm, I'm actually okay. Here's what I'm actually thinking about. And you could say, oh, great. And everything calms down. Maybe you were anxious for three seconds <laughs> before you decided to ask that person, but three seconds of anxiety versus three hours or three days of anxiety and trying to people please and trying to make them like you and trying to reward and return their love to you. Three seconds and it's done. That's the power of more secure attachment. And that's what I'm going to show you here today. So through this, I hope so far that you're invested in learning about anxious attachment, because if you have it, it can feel hopeless. I know that it's not hopeless. Let me tell you that right now, but it can feel that way. Like Adam's just giving me bad news about myself that I'm just stuck with. No, what we're going to do next is look at the top signs of anxious attachment, the top seven that I see the most. Now it's going to be tough to self-reflect like this. So please bear in mind. We're looking at these seven signs. We're looking in this mirror because this is the first part of fixing your attachment. None of the seven things that you're about to hear are fixed in stone. You can change the way that you attach to other people. Now, I know it can hurt to look in this mirror and see what you're doing wrong. I get that. But you must recognize these issues first so that you can reflect on them and realize that it's time to change. And let me be clear, you can change. So don't lose hope as we roll through these. And if you don't check every single box, that's okay. All of these are signs of attachment, anxious attachment. So if you're less severe, if you're more severe, it all comes out the same because the goal is to become fully secure. So together, let's take the step forward and look at the top seven signs that you are anxiously attached and how to tell it's time for you to make this change. Sign number one, overthinking small details. Now, this could look like obsessing over text messages after you send them. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. Oh, that's too much. It could also be nuances in conversations. Oh, no, they said this. They thought that. They did this. It's, it's a hyper vigilance around tiny details and what they mean for your emotional safety. Now, let me tell you about a client I had who came in with one of these issues. They were a constant text worrier. They would send a text and then focus on it obsessively for hours afterward until they got a reply. They would sit there and read and reread and reread and reread and reread their text messages, hoping that the other person wasn't going to be offended. And the longer it took to get a reply, the more certain they were that they would get, they were offended. So sometimes they'd send a follow-up. Hey, I'm really sorry about that. If I offended you with that and they wouldn't get a reply. So, Hey, you know, I, I really am sorry. And I'd like to make it up to you. And then eventually the person responds two hours later. Hey, I was in a movie. Sorry. No, you didn't offend me. No, you don't need to make it up for me. Yes, I do like cheese sandwiches. <laughs> Some random simple text that spiraled them out into that overthinking. Now that overthinking is part of the brain on the right hand side. As your emotional brain gets agitated, it chronically circles and circles and circles and can't process logically. And then it gets worse and worse and worse. Now this negatively affects you because you're scared all the time. You are nervous and worried and every little detail drags you down. Your processing power and your brain drains because you are so fixated on those little details that you can't accomplish much. It, it's hard to accomplish most things. This is why most people with anxious attachment that they don't complete projects. They don't complete goals because they can't. They get bogged down in all those hard little details. So this is why it negatively affects your life. Now, the root cause of this, again, is trying to be safe. It goes back to childhood. Some little details set off one of your caregivers, or you felt like it was your fault, or you felt like you did little things wrong all the time. So you are, are hyper-focused on making sure everything is perfect and that you don't reveal your imperfections and that you don't let other people down and get abandoned. Fear of abandonment is the driving force here with anxious attachment style. That's the root cause is you will be revealed and abandoned for the tiniest details. Now, a life without this, once you fix secure attachment, imagine sending a message and not worrying about it. Imagine small details not being that important. Imagine tracking the small details once, putting them to bed and saying good enough. Imagine being able to say good enough on everything, and it really is. 
You don't say good enough and then, oh, get blindsided later. You say good enough and it really is. So you can move on. You can invest. You can finish projects. You can be confident in messages. You can send them and stop apologizing. That's that's what it looks like to have secure attachment. It's for the small details not to be a threat. No more threats. That's what we're going to build. Now, sign number two springs from that fear of abandonment and that overthinking and the details. If you are constantly fixated on that, right, you need constant reassurance. Sign number two, need for constant reassurance. Doesn't mean you are even grabbing people and making them reassure you, but you need it all the time. This is seeking, seeking frequent validation in your relationships, needing people to tell you they're not mad at you. I had one client that she was constantly asking her husband, are you mad at me? No. 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 Every single day because he kind of just had a stoic face. <laughs> and when they came into my coaching, he said, I am so tired of constantly being accused of being mad at her. And then she asks me, but then she doesn't believe me. So she digs and she is certain that I am mad at her. It's exhausting. And she was so crushed because now she actually had done something wrong, right? The need for constant reassurance is usually what anxiously attached people actually do wrong. That's why this negatively affects you is you are so obsessed with needing that connection and that constant validation that you actually do the wrong things that make people exhausted. This right here is one of the worst pieces of anxious attachment on the outside. It's one of the only things people actually care about with you. It's one of the only reasons people will actually push you away. This can be fixed. <laughs> this can be fixed. Now, the root cause of this, again, is that fear that somebody doesn't like you, that you have done something wrong, that you are not safe. What you're really saying is, am I safe? Am I safe? I trust you. Am I safe? Am I safe? It's constantly checking in on being safe. Now, when we fix this and we become secure, I am safe. Am I safe? Yes, I am. That's the question and the answer. It goes inward and you're able to assess calmly. Over time, you don't even need to because it stops occurring to you. Am I safe? Wow, I haven't checked in in a while. Yeah, yeah, I think I am. Let me run through the checklist. Yeah, I'm safe. You can actually care for your own nervous system. You can calm yourself. You will be calmer, longer. You will need less reassurance, even from yourself. This means the one real thing that you do that upsets other people, gone. It's phenomenal. Now, sign number three, we touched on it before, the fear of abandonment. This comes from being two years old, three years old, one year old, and your parents not responding well to your behavior. Something went wrong. Either they were depressed and didn't react to you, they were absent, they were drunk, they were stressed out and didn't have time for you, you were in daycare, all kinds of things can go wrong. But something told you that they didn't have time for you or care for you. Even if they did, your brain learned that they didn't. And your brain learned that you have to protect yourself as a child from death by not being abandoned. Because a two-year-old in the forest dies. That's what our brains are meant for way back in, way back then. So fear of abandonment is really fear of death. Think about that. It links it up in your nervous system. Fear of abandonment, fear of death. Dr. Robert Glover in his book, No More Mr. Nice Guy, talks extensively about this fear of abandonment being linked to that fear of death. And he's right. Your limbic system is tied directly in then to your relationships. That's the problem. I had a client who was always afraid. His wife was one moment away from leaving him. Always afraid. Everything he did was just enough to keep her around just a little bit longer. Everything from her past was a terrible threat because it meant she wanted more than he had and more he could give. He was always afraid of abandonment, which went, he was always afraid of death. So his anxiety was constantly up at 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10, 9 out of 10. He was always afraid. That's why this affects you so badly. And that's why we've got to fix it. So a life without this. Imagine secure attachment. Imagine being able to calm down and say, I'm okay. 
I'm not going to die if someone gets mad at me. Either because we're going to solve the problems because I trust them. It's okay. They're not going to leave me. We'll solve a problem. Or, and, I don't have to be afraid because I'm not going to die. I'm going to be okay no matter what. That right there, that feeling is secure attachment. That's what some people grow up with, and it's what some people have to manually build as an adult. But that's the difference that you're going to experience. Now, sign number four. It's similar to number one, of obsession over details. But at four, number four, high sensitivity to your partner's moods. It's walking obsessively on eggshells all the time. It's, are you mad at me? Are you mad at me? It's, what am I doing? Am I, am I safe? What do you want from me? It's a constant obsession with staring at everybody else. When you get into a social group and you're with friends, you're just hyper vigilant about not saying the wrong thing and tracking who's feeling what so that you can't even feel close to other people. In fact, you may feel more alone than ever when you are with groups of people that you love. This separates you from the people that you love most. This keeps you stuck in a hyper paranoid state about the people that you love where you can't enjoy those relationships. That's why this is so bad. I had a client. She had lots of good friends and she never believed any of them would ever really love her. And she was constantly fixating on everything they did and said, every little word, every eye movement, every eyebrow raise, every little expression they made meant something. Now, you learn this as a child. Sometimes mom, mom is supposed to be mirroring to you. Mirroring neurons in your brain are supposed to activate. And you're supposed to discover when she feels good, when she feels bad, when she feels safe, when you are safe. And something about your mom mirroring or not mirroring with you made it hard for you to learn when you are safe. Or you were constantly vigilant. Maybe mom was inconsistent. Maybe dad was inconsistent. Somebody was love, then anger, then love, then anger. And you learned to stay hyper-focused on them, to walk on eggshells at all times and be always vigilant so that when the shift came, <gasps> you could be safe. That's what this is about. And that's why fixing it, fixing this and becoming secure, oh, you can sit back. You can trust other people to tell you, hey, you said something that upset me. And I want to fix it. Oh, okay. Let's fix it. You can trust that people will bring things to you reasonably. So you don't have to be hyper vigilant for the tiniest change. You can trust that people aren't going to suddenly switch and become mean or vicious towards you or, or completely unloving and apathetic at a moment's notice. You can trust that things will be safe. That's what secure attachment feels like so that you can sit in a group of friends and laugh and let your heart go. And it feels so good. Now, sign number five is the opposite. Because if you don't feel good with a group of people, maybe you would feel good alone, right? No. <laughs> no. With anxious attachment, most of the time, people have, number five, a difficulty enjoying their alone time. They have a need for constant companionship and refreshing and nurturing. Not always, but very often this is the case. And here's why. It's because I had a client come in and he could not spend time alone in a room in quiet. He had to have absolute loud music blaring, something being present, something distracting him because if he was ever alone in the quiet, all of a sudden, all his negative self-talk started up. You did this wrong. You did this wrong. You're wrong this way. You're bad this way. This is why you're wrong. This is you. You're stupid. All these bad thoughts would boil up. See, the problem with anxious attachment is that you don't like yourself. You blame yourself for everything that happened as a kid. You blame yourself for people not liking you. And then you start absorbing that and saying, everything with me is wrong. So time alone is awful. Now, time alone with overwhelming stimulation, arguably you're not really alone. You're sitting there being overwhelmingly stimulated by technology, a little bit different. But time alone with low stimulation feels awful to most people. Now this is really negative because you can't go your whole life depending on being around other people all the time. This makes it draining on your partner to constantly be around you all the time. They can't even go to work because they know you're going to be stressed and agitated. Even if you're not crying and clinging on them at the door, they know that you're going to be miserable alone. 
So it makes it harder on other people around you. It's also very difficult on you because you can't sit there and reason through things and process and reflect and maybe do meditation or take a walk. It's very difficult because you can't be alone with yourself because you don't like yourself. And then it crushes your self-esteem and your confidence. All of that, huge negatives. Now, without this, when you have secure attachment, you can be comfortable in your own presence. I'm not going to say that you will adore yourself and think you're the best person in the world, but imagine the absence of negative self-talk. Imagine things are quiet and they just stay quiet. Imagine you're alone in a room and you're comfortable in your own presence. Imagine going for a drive and you don't have to have music blaring because you can just sit in your own thoughts as you drive and be comfortable in your own skin. That's secure attachment. That's what we're going to build. Now, sign number six is rapid relationship progression. As you can tell, anxiously attached people tend not to do very well when they are alone. Not that they're never alone, but they tend not to do well because they don't feel good. They don't feel good by themselves and they crave safety and validation. And safety to them is acceptance from other people and being close with other people. That is safety. This is why they tend to move very, 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 very quickly into relationships, both emotionally and often physically. I had one female client that she felt every time she went on a date, she had to expect that it would escalate physically. And she had to accept whatever the other person was going to escalate to. Sometimes that meant the full deed on the first night. Sometimes it meant a couple nights, but she always had to accept what anyone wanted to do physically because at least she wouldn't be alone. I won't be interesting enough to keep his attention if I don't let him escalate. That was what she told me. They, pro they progressed quickly, but then she would develop feelings very rapidly. Well, he wouldn't do these things if he didn't like me. So that means he likes me and he's going to stay. But I have to keep doing these things so that he'll stay. This affects you negatively because you don't jump into relationships that fast. And then flood with hormones that quickly. Bonding hormones, oxytocin, everything. Everything floods. You can't jump in that fast and have real compatibility testing. You're essentially slamming a tremendous amount of alcohol, getting yourself intoxicated, and then hoping it works out for the best is what's happening with the, with the hormone soup that's flooding through your brain. So you're going to have difficult relationships. You're also not going to feel very good about yourself because you're going to feel like you have to constantly do what anybody else wants you to. You're going to feel like a doormat. You're going to feel like it's your only option. Now, fixing this doesn't mean you become a prude doesn't mean you have to live by somebody's standards somewhere. It means you live by your standards. It means that you test for compatibility better. It means that you maybe take your time a little slower to make sure somebody's a right fit before you invest your heart so you don't get your heart broken over and over and over. And it also makes you believe you are not a doormat, that you can push back and say, no, I'm not ready to go there. And that people who are a good fit will say, Fair enough. When will you be okay? When can we talk about that? Okay, that's your target. Great. What other things need to happen first? Oh, we can do those other things. And they walk with you fairly and in good faith through those other things. That's a secure relationship. You build it intentionally together. We're going to talk about how to do that too. Now, number seven springs right from number six and from all of these, actually. Frequent relationship turmoil. All your relationships tend to be roller coasters, up and down and up and down. I had one gentleman who came into my coaching and all his friendships and romantic relationships would fall apart. They would go through this huge like bonding spike. It was incredible. And then sort of plateau, and then come down and then he'd start trying to make them happy, make them happy, make them happy, but it wouldn't work. They might bump again and they might do this and go up and down and up and down. He was constantly trying to keep other people happy, but eventually they would nosedive and the other person would leave and it'd be a big falling out and he had no idea why and he blamed himself over and over and over this constant roller coaster it was awful for him if this is you it might feel awful to you and you might have experienced a lot of ups and downs in friendships and in romance this negatively affects you obviously because you can't form relationships that feel safe and stable 
All this does is reinforce those endless fears that you've had. All this does is make you feel stuck in this pattern. Which is why when you fix it, and you will, it feels so good. It feels so good to fix this and have steady relationships. They might go up, but they don't go and spike and then plunge and spike. And they go like this. Relationships that come and go in, in, in slow waves. They don't even come and go. You are constantly maintaining level connection with the other person. It's steady. It's stable. It's a warm, accepting relationship. So your nervous system calms down. Your level two Maslow's hierarchy of needs is satisfied. You get love and belonging with these people. You're not craving endless reassurance because you feel connected to them. And everything gets better. That's what secure attachment looks like in this regard. Again, I'm going to show you how to build this. I've told you this so many times for this video because it can feel like it's never going to get better, right? So honesty time, you guys. Honest reflection. How many of these seven boxes do you check right now? Whatever your number is, whether it's two or seven, this can tell you if you are anxiously attached and how, sec how severe that issue might be right now. Maybe you are all the way and you're in dread right now about what I'm about to say. It's okay. I got you. Maybe you've had a couple of them and you say, yeah, I've worked on them a bit, but I've got some room to go. That's okay. We can work on that too. Right now at this point, it is normal though to feel like this is going to hold you back forever. Like you're never going to get over this because that belief is that it's something inside of you that's wrong that make other people act this way, but it's not. So here is a proven fact and I'm going to talk about why it's proven. You can change this reality. You can change this anxious attachment and become securely attached. Now, I know this based on my 15 years of training and experience, plus science, plus all the research that backs this up. So let's go through that to show you. Now, this can be fixed because it's a learned behavior from your childhood. Now, learned behaviors, right? You did these things to get safe. You perceived that you could be abandoned. Abandonment would lead to death. So you had to do everything in your power not to be abandoned. As I'm telling you this, you're already starting to think about that and how irrational it is for you to continue doing those behaviors. Maybe you've never thought about it in that way before, but it's starting to click. Now, as you fix these things, as you fix those behaviors, number one, your brain is going to change. Your mind is going to change. How you are going to react is going to change. You're going to start realizing things differently. So number one on the pathway of fixing this is just gathering this information. Learning it can help you become different. It's also a skill issue. You probably never learned the skills you need for new outcomes. For example, if you grew up in a family where this was the only way to stay safe and the only thing modeled for you, maybe mom was really anxious and dad was avoidant and ran away. So you had to learn just like mom, those skills of navigating through making people happy. You never learned other skills that can navigate your world to get better outcomes. You never learned how to fix relationships in advance. You never learned how to build steadier relationships. You don't know the phrasings yet. That's okay. You can learn those too. And when you learn those and you learn those skills, you develop different outcomes and can make things happen for you. Now, this is also a brain chemistry issue caused by the social, social isolation, the fear, the lack of connection. There's a lot of things here. The big five brain chemicals. I'm going to go through it really quick. One is oxytocin, the love hormone, the bonding hormone. We're supposed to flood with this when we are little kids, especially with mom and with our families. And we're supposed to feel warm and safe and accepted. And if we don't get much of that in childhood or in adulthood, that's diminished. Chronic pain is one big symptom of low oxytocin, but also GABA, gamma amino biuric acid. It's an inhibitory neurotransmitter that shuts down the expression of cortisol in a number of ways. So it reduces your anxiety and your depression symptoms. GABA releases when you have a lot of oxytocin. It also releases melatonin to help you sleep at night. So if you don't feel loved and accepted, you'll have a harder time sleeping, a harder time fighting anxiety, a harder time fighting depression. You'll feel like this. Now, next is vasopressin. Vasopressin is a hormone released when you solve problems together and it bonds you with another person. It's your brain saying, we did this together. I feel safe with this person because we solve problems. But when you have anxious attachment, you don't believe you can solve problems with other people because you're a burden and you can't fix things. 
So your vasopressin is also low. And there's a number of things that that does in your brain. And next, serotonin. A lot of people with attachment issues, they might try to compensate by running, by exercising, by eating right, by sun tanning, all kinds of things. But what they're doing is trying desperately to get their serotonin that they should be getting largely through their good emotional connections with other people. They're good, relaxing times with humans that they love and that they are loved by. So when your serotonin's low and all of that is low, you have dopamine left. Dopamine binging. A, a lot of addiction problems of all kinds of addictions, chemical and behavioral, come down to a brain that looks like this. This is an attachment issue brain. Fixing this gives you all those chemicals back in a number of ways, right? You might have wondered before why we have so many mental health issues and why we have so many chemical imbalances, why humans are, are evolved to need drugs to function. Well, we don't. We need relationships like this to function. Are there some people who may need some chemical help? Maybe. But this, this is the brain you want. Right now, you may have this brain. This is the brain you're going to build through secure attachment. Now, guys, I know this because I've helped thousands of people resolve anxious attachment using my proven approach. There's a couple of key things that we need to show you exactly what to do and how to fix this. The approach that I teach to people is to build new behavioral patterns through guided experiences. So those behaviors and, and things that you did as a child are still with you and you need to have guided experiences that show you those behaviors are no longer useful. You have the realization and then you prove it to yourself over time and desensitize yourself to those fears. This also means mastering new skills to help you cultivate new outcomes, new phrases, new ways of explaining things and articulating your feelings, knowing how and when to escalate and de-escalate, how to negotiate with other people, how to track for trust, boundaries, all kinds of things. Doing these things over time will change your brain chemistry to build this where you feel so much better and you can thrive so much better. Now, I know that this is fact, yes, because I've helped thousands of people, but also because it goes back to the earliest pieces of psychology. The famous behaviorist B.F. Skinner theorized that humans can change their behavior only when they try out a new behavior and they're rewarded consistently for that new behavior. In other words, when you do something different than you usually do and it turns out well, you're likely to do it again. That's the mechanism here that we're talking about that creates change. And it's how we change attachment too. build new skills, apply those new skills and see the results and change your brain chemistry over time. B.F. Skinner said it. I'm saying it too. Now, all that science and all those pieces, they back up what I already know and what I have seen again and again. This method is proven because I've applied it so many times and helped clients see the rewards in those positive changes that they make. That's why they keep going after the first few scary things. That's why they ultimately adapt this new behavior completely and build secure attachment because it feels so good to become secure. I had one client named Steve, who came in and he was so afraid in his dating life that he would walk into dates and try to just please the other woman on the first date and could never get a second date. When he followed this process, he became more confident. He actually built his friendships first. His brain chemistry went like this. Then he walked into dates and would say, hi, I'm Steve. How you doing? Tell me about yourself. And would ask questions and be curious about her instead of trying to make her happy and please her. Women started responding differently. He actually got a loving, wonderful girlfriend, and he's now very confident. Now, I've seen hundreds of guys like Steve make that same transition, but I've also seen people like Sarah. She was a married woman who came in, and she felt completely disconnected in her marriage and believed her husband would never love her. Not really. Her emotions were low. Her emotional intimacy was low. He had no idea what to do, and she thought it was because she wasn't worthy of love. Then she learned to find what her needs were, to build her self-confidence a little bit, to ask him for things. And when she did, he responded in a big way, in a great way. They built great emotional intimacy and they spent so much loving time together where she could relax in his presence and feel totally loved and cherished. It was such a huge change. And again, I've helped hundreds of women just like Sarah make that change too. So here's my question to you. Are you ready to fix your anxious attachment? If so, here's the first step that's going to set you on the path to fixing attachment and fixing the relationship with yourself.
Now, keep in mind that anxious attachment all comes back to how you view yourself first. So we have to fix that part before you can change how you show up in your world with other people. If you always believe you don't deserve to be loved, you are never going to be able to do the things you need to fix that with others. So it all comes down to making decisions based on your needs, your values, and your goals, and not what you think others want from you. It's a hyper focus, right? All of those seven signs are focusing on doing anything to stop from being abandoned, to stay in relationships, even if they're not a good fit, and to make people like you. We're going to change the way you make decisions. First, you need to figure out what your needs are. Needs are hurts. Where does it hurt? Where do you feel lonely, scared, wounded, nervous? Where do you feel that? Where do you feel unfulfilled, hungry in your heart? Where are you feeling that? I need to feel loved. I need to feel safe. Those are probably two big ones that pop up right now for anxious attachment. I need to feel loved and I need to feel safe. Okay. From now on, when you make decisions, keep those two things in mind. I need to feel loved and I need to feel safe. Now, the second thing you need to do is your values. I also call them principles, right? You often will break your own principles to make other people like you. Go back to the women that I talked about in the earlier part who on the first date, she would just let physical intimacy escalate as much as the other person wanted to. She didn't like herself because she didn't want to do that. It wasn't tied down to some sort of prudishness. She didn't want to just be open for whoever wants her. She wanted to be selective. She wanted to be more herself and to have her needs matter. She wanted to wait a little bit longer and make sure she had a connection. But she broke that so that people wouldn't abandon her, even on the first date. Find your values, right? For me, it's honesty, integrity, and compassion. For some people, it's courage, loyalty, right? Freedom, creativity. There are so many. Look some up. But find your values. Where does it hurt when you break them? Which ones are you most ashamed of not exhibiting? Think of some times you were ashamed. What value did you break? Write down two to three values that are yours, and you're going to live with them. We're going to talk about that here in a minute. But that's also what your decisions will be based on. And the last one is your goals. What's your goal for life? What do you want to accomplish in your life? Do you want to build a family? Do you want to build a business? Do you want to build a nonprofit? Do you want to help people? Do you want to help people fix attachment? That was one of mine. Do you want to help people learn better financial literacy? Do you want to build the ultimate video game, right? Whatever it may be, what are your goals? You also need to make decisions based on that. So here's what you do. Here's how you apply these things. Number one, when you hit a decision point in your life, any decision at all, you're going to stop. Because you know that you tend to give in to the other person and say, what's going to make them happy, even if it doesn't make them happy? What's going to minimize friction? What's going to make people not leave me? That's your deciding criteria right now. When a decision comes, when you're tossing and turning in bed, going back to the beginning of this video, when you're looking at a text message and you're afraid because you haven't got a response, you're going to send five more. When you're in a shower thinking about what am I going to say to make people not mad at me? What are my needs? Well, to feel safe and loved. What would actually make me feel safe and loved? Well, not sending a flood of texts. That's not going to do that. That's going to make you feel less safe, actually. What do my principles have to say about this? Well, honesty, loyalty, integrity, compassion, courage, right? Courage. Courage would mean holding the line in the face of fear. Okay. Then I need to live with some courage. What are my long-term goals? Well, to build a loving family and friend system that supports me and that I take care of them as well. Well, will sending a flood of texts or relying at my way out of someone mad at me or, or violating my boundaries just to please people and then get in a relationship with someone who likes to violate boundaries. Is that going to nurture my long-term goal? Probably not. Start making decisions based on your values, your goals, and your needs. People will say this feels selfish, but I'm going to say this. This is the start of your process because it helps you feel better because you will finally gain self-respect. 
Every time you break your boundaries, your goals, and your needs, it confirms to you that something is wrong with you that you don't deserve love, right? It makes you think all over again, this, this is why people don't like me. This is why people don't treat me well. When you stop doing that, you'll actually respect yourself and say, I am a person of, of these values. I am chasing down these goals. I am taking care of my needs. When you start this process, even a little bit, even just your decisions with yourself, you will feel so much better about yourself. And that begins to transform your relationships with everybody else as well. Self-respect now is only the start because from there it gets so much better. Now you might have a hard time picturing secure attachment, picturing what that would look like, picturing that it's, it's going to happen for you. So down the road, what should you expect? Let me show you so that you can envision it and get motivated for this better life that you're going to enjoy. Because remember, B.F. Skinner said you have to experience the reward consistently to then move into that space. So if your brain feels like this, if you know that your brain can feel like this, you can take those scary steps that are harder when it's like this and you can start growing like this. So let's talk about what it looks like when you have secure attachment. The first thing you have is unwavering self-confidence. This is a deep-rooted belief in your own worth and independent of other people validating you. doesn't mean you don't care what other people think, but it means that you are consistent and calm in yourself. One of my clients who fixed their attachment, they were shocked at how they didn't care when jerks at their workplace were mean to them because they'd say, that person's just having a bad day. That's fine. It's not about me. Before, it was, oh, I've done everything wrong. Then it was, nope. They're having a bad day. I know for a fact that I'm, I'm upholding my principles and chasing my goals. I'm doing right, which means the problem's in you. That unwavering self-confidence. The next part is stable, trusting relationships. The foundation of a relationship should be built on mutual trust and understanding between the people. And that eliminates needless misunderstandings, especially because you can resolve them quickly. You can talk with each other and say, hey, I trust you. Let's talk this through. And they will do that with you. And they can do that with you too. This was the biggest piece for a couple that I worked with when before they were constantly misunderstanding each other and fighting over everything. When they built more secure attachment, they could just ask each other, hey, did you mean to do this thing? No, I didn't. I didn't mean to do that. Did I do that? Yeah. Did it hurt you? Yeah. Wow, I'm so sorry. How can we fix this? Well, let's do this. Great. And they would fix it. Misunderstandings melted away because there was no really room for them to grow. And that's productive conflict resolution. That means efficiently navigating through those disagreements. That leads you to stronger relationships, you guys, and more harmonious living. So that couple who was able to navigate that and start stop fighting, not only did they just slow down the fights, then they could actually resolve things quicker. Then they could resolve things they'd never imagined they could resolve. Then they could start talking about their bedroom life and make it more fulfilling. They could talk about their daily life. They could talk about needs and struggles. And the conflicts were resolved like that. It made it so good for them, you guys. I, I'm excited telling you about that because it, it's, it's wonderful to see. It is wonderful to see and it's wonderful to experience. And I hope that you get the chance to experience it. If you follow this path, I know that you will. Now, next comes independence and voluntary interdependence. It's a perfectly balanced space for your personal self with quality time and relationships and foster growth as an individual and as a pair. So instead of being dependent on your relationships to feel good, you can be a little more independent, but then you can choose to lean in instead of having to lean in. You can choose to lean in and connect with the other person and get your needs met together right? I had a great, great male client who did this with his friend, his best friend. And they built this connection where he wasn't bogging his friend down all the time. He could step back and let his friend breathe and fly. Then his friend wanted to spend more time with him. So they enjoyed their time together even more. This also helps have thriving professional relationships because when you fix your anxious attachment, you can collaborate, you can network, and you can lead without the weight of anxious attachment and hindering interactions dragging you down. You're not constantly terrified of what everyone else thinks of you, sabotaging yourself, making people happy, being a doormat, breaking your principles, and being unstable and inconsistent. Instead, 
He can be like my client who had this huge transformation in his professional life where he started gaining promotions, speaking up, telling people what he felt. And the bosses loved it because he was so proactive about solving problems instead of hiding them so they wouldn't be mad at him. He was proactive about gaining skills and about transforming. And his great boundaries led him to rise through the ranks very quickly. It was the anxious attachment that was holding him back all those times. Now, this brings us back to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, level two, safety and security, because that's the next thing that gets fixed. As you navigate life's ups and downs with more of a stable emotional core, you bounce back from setbacks with ease. You feel safe. I had one client that after she fixed her anxious attachment, she had a pretty significant financial blow that hurt. And instead of collapsing and saying, oh, I'm helpless, oh, it's all my fault, she was able to step into it and say, okay, this sucks. How can I use the relationships I've built, not take money from people, but how can I use the relationships I've built to make this better? And then she did. She went to work. She asked for a promotion. She explained to some friends that, you know, I'm not going to be able to go out all the time. And they responded by saying, that's fine. Let's spend some time in. She was able to get help she needed and restructure her relationships to take care of that temporary financial setback. Life was easier because she didn't feel like she had to play the game. Which brings us back one more time to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? The top levels, pursuit of genuine happiness. That shift from seeking constant validation, always feeling unsafe, always obsessing over details, fearing abandonment, always sabotaging yourself. Instead, to pursuing intrinsic happiness and life goals that resonate with your true self. That's everything, you guys. That's everything you've been looking for. That's the life that you want to be living. I had one client who was able to redirect their life path from chasing approval into chasing their dreams. Dreams that they had actually shelved due to fear of judgment and rejection and abandonment. And instead they started chasing that dream and they're living it right now, you guys. So you can build all of this. You can build this all step by step. It sounds like a lot, but it's doable. You just need to overcome your anxious attachment style. Now, at this point, it is very normal if you feel nervous or if you worry that you can't do it. Everybody with anxious attachment style feels that, right? The idea that this can work for everybody but me. I'm the exception because I'm not worthy. Everybody feels that at first, so it is normal. Don't let those normal fears stop you from taking your first step and experiencing the change. So take that first step, your needs, your values, your goals, take that step, define them, write them down, put them up where you can see them all the time. Put them on your fridge, put them on your bathroom mirror, put them on your phone as a background, put those everywhere and start making your decisions your way. At least practice it. Even if you don't get it right all the time, start practicing it because it will change everything. And after that first step, come back here. And let's check out the Attachment Bootcamp video course because it walks you through the specific formula that I have to becoming secure. There are a lot of skills that you're still going to need to learn and a lot of experiences that you need to have that will change you after that first step. And that course, the Attachment Bootcamp, will lay all of this out for you in a concise game plan that makes it very simple. I won't say easy, but very simple to understand and simple to follow where anyone can do it. Now, guys, I know that these steps can feel overwhelming when you're just starting this process. I know. And if you're feeling that fear too, and if you need assistance, I am here to help. Reach out in the comments. I read them myself and I will be there and we'll talk. So what I want you to take from this video, biggest thing is that recognizing those signs of anxious attachment in yourself. It's the first part of changing yourself and taking control of your life. There is hope. You have hope power that you don't realize yet. These seven signs that we discussed is not a sentence to lifelong insecurity. They are calls to action. Now you have the first step. So I hope, please, that you will take that first step. Make your decisions based on your needs, your values, your goals, and reclaim that power in your life. Take that first step, then come back. And let's finish this process together. So if you saw yourself in these seven signs today, or if you want to dive deeper, don't hesitate to reach out. 
Together, we can build a path towards secure attachment for you and the life that you've been wanting. It's not just a dream, you guys. You can build this for yourself. With the right help, anybody can overcome anxious attachment and become secure and satisfied and fulfilled in their life. I am Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist, and I am here to help. And I will be waiting in the comments. So reach out and I'll be there.